is an interesting series of lessons. Uh, when Brother Greg first asked me if I'd take this lesson on Cornelius as a highlight in Peter's life and then to look at his uh, fall in Antioch as a result of his hypocrisy and tie those together, to basically address this theme of being on track, getting off track, and then getting back on track. But when I think about that, uh, that particular subject matter and what's unfolding in this lesson, I think there are some preliminaries that need to be addressed. Just talk about some general things having to do with apostasy. John Calvin came up with five planks to his system of salvation. Uh, total hereditary depravity, unconditional salvation, limited atonement. You've heard all of that before. The last part of that plank is preservation of the saints, which means that God elected uh, people for salvation, and he chose you. He said, for example, Ben, you're going to be saved, and uh, Brother Caleb, you're going to be lost, and uh, uh, Cody, you're going to be saved. He just selected those arbitrarily. Well, if you're a part of the elect, then he has to do something to make sure you stay faithful, that you can't fall from grace. And so the doctrine of preservation of the saints is sometimes better known as once saved, always saved. Well, when we look at this series of Peter uh, reaching his height, perhaps, uh, in the work that he did among the Gentiles as well as the Jews... Uh, you see Peter at a, at a high. He's on track. He's moving along. Things are going well. And then you catch Peter at a later time in his ministry. You see that he's fallen off the track. So the very subject matter presupposes some possibilities. Number one, it presupposes the possibility of apostasy. Why would we be studying about Peter being on track and then getting off track if there's no such thing as possibility of apostasy. Why don't you look at a couple of passages with me. Galatians chapter 5, the apostle Paul is writing to the churches of Galatia. And we're going to revisit Galatians in a little bit. But it's interesting that it is in Galatians where Paul likewise addresses uh, Peter's apostasy, his hypocrisy, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. But I want you to look at chapter 5. Start reading with verse 2, if you will. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will profit you nothing. We could park right there and talk about the force of those words. He's writing to Christians, and he says, in essence, if you go back to the old law and you accept circumcision, there's no profit in the blood of Christ. There's no profit. And the implication is, it's as if you had never obeyed Christ in the first place, as if He had never died for your sins, but continue to read. Yea, I testify again to every man that received the circumcision, that he's a debtor to do the whole law. You are severed from Christ, ye who would be justified by the law. You are fallen away from grace. When I was a young preacher, I was called by a neighboring preacher in a town not too far from me, and he was going to be out of town, and he said, would you go down and do my radio station for me? And I said, do I record that? Do I do it live? He said, however you want to do it. Well, I prefer to do radio programs live, if at all possible. And so I drove down to Atoka, Oklahoma, and I preached that day on God's uh, saving grace and the blood of Christ. And the danger of casting that aside. And I used a few passages in Hebrews for that. And the very next Sunday, a denominational preacher who had the lesson right behind me, he had recorded it, and he just raked me over the coals for teaching the possibility of apostasy. Well, when Frank got back into town, he said, uh, have you heard his sermon? And I said, no, I listened to it. And I said, would you give me one more Sunday? And I went back down there and I preached on the subject of the possibility of apostasy. And the point I emphasized came from this passage right here. How can you fall from something in which you have never been? It's virtually impossible. 
You cannot fall out of a tree unless you've been in that tree. If you can, I'd like for you to explain to me how that's possible. I want you to look at another passage, 2 Peter chapter 2. All of these, and there's so many others. In fact, the entire book of Hebrews, what is the purpose in the book of Hebrews if those Christians, those Hebrew Christians, were not in danger of losing their souls? The whole epistle is wasted, is it not? I'm looking at 2 Peter chapter 2, starting, if you will, with verse uh, 20. Let's start with verse 20. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. Will you just look at the words? They've escaped the contamination of the sinful world. Their souls are cleansed. And then they become entangled therein and overcome. The last state is become worse with them than the first. I'm not a mathematical genius, but I do know you can just use some common sense here. If the worst state, I mean, if the latter state is that of being lost and you're in a worse state than that bad state, you're lost. I mean, we've lost the ability to think sometimes. And these are certain implications that this entire series, it's an, impl it's an implication that's there whether people recognize that or not. Uh, here's another interesting uh, possibility when I look at this theme of Peter being on track, getting off track, or the various sins that he committed and how he was restored. It not only implies that it's possible to fall from grace, it also implies that it's possible that someone who has sinned can be restored. Uh, there's a young lady, a young teenage lady that I'm acquainted with, and she's having some really spiritual difficulty. She's not here. She lives in another state. And I know her parents. And she's come to the conclusion that Christ did not die for, and she's, this is her, these are her words. He did not die for me specifically. He died for the human race, but not for me specifically. And I think she's wrestling with her guilt. She knows she has some uh, problems that she has to overcome. And so what she's focusing on is her guilt. And I think she's come to the conclusion that perhaps she sinned so horribly. How could God ever forgive her? I want to tell you tonight that as you're studying this subject of apostasy and restoration, that it is possible for you to come back to God. Don't convince yourself that you have some kind of a special sin that keeps you barred from heaven. Well, again, let's look at a couple of passages, if you will. Turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 1 and just reflect on Paul's life. I don't have the time to really go into detail on these as much as I would like. But you know the story of Paul, Saul of Tarsus. Uh, not only did he uh, hate Christ, he hated Christianity. He did everything within his power to cause Christians to blaspheme the name of God. He persecuted Christians. He went to the authorities and got letters to go drag Christians out of their homes and take them before the tribunal and have them tried for denying their, the faith of their forefathers, and then if possible have them thrown in jail or perhaps even slain. I want you to listen to what Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 1. And I'm going to start reading with verse 15. Faithful is the saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the chief. This young lady that I'm talking about, no doubt right now, she feels as if she is the chief of sinners. Maybe you felt that way at times. But listen to what Paul writes next. He says, How be it, verse 16, For this cause I obtained mercy, that in me as chief might Jesus Christ show forth all His longsuffering for an example of them that should thereafter believe on Him unto eternal life. Can I squeeze this down into just a Texas summary? 
Paul was saying, look, if I can be saved for what I've done, you can be saved for what you've done. Makes no difference what you did. Think of those Jews who assisted trying Jesus and were instrumental in nailing Him to the cross. And as Peter proclaimed that sermon in Acts chapter 2, and when he gets through, they were pricked in their hearts that they had crucified, they knew they had crucified Jesus Christ. And they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter didn't say there's not anything you can do. You've sinned such a horrible sin that there is no forgiveness. Turn over to 1 John chapter 5. In 1 John chapter 5, there's, there is a, the same concept of... It, of the hope that comes from a person who repents and gets back on track. And have you ever heard somebody say, I'm guilty of the unpardonable sin? Am I, have I sinned the unpardonable sin? And uh, Brother Guy in Woods did a great job of addressing that in a little book on sermons on salvation. And the point that one of the points he makes is if you're concerned about that, it at least shows that you have a tender heart that you can still be touched. You're still looking. You want to know, have I done something that will bar me from heaven? I want you to look, if you will, at verses 14 and following. 1 John 5, 14 and following. And this is the boldness which we have toward him that if we ask Anything according to His will, He heareth us. And if we know that He heareth us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions which we've asked of Him. Now sometimes we'll read that and we'll say, prayer is powerful and God listens and He does. But we find it difficult in the depth of our guilt and our sin to actually ask God to forgive us and then get to the point where we forgive ourselves. You ever thought about Peter after he denied Christ? And B.J.'s going to deal with this tomorrow night. That after he denied Christ and the Bible says he went off and he wept bitterly, what was he thinking? Can God ever forgive me? Can Jesus forgive me? Is it possible? And we're going to find out that he had his ups and he had his downs. But then if you will, look at verses 16. If any man see his brother sinning a sin not unto death, he shall ask and God will give him life for them that sin not unto death. I'm interested in this phrase, the sin not unto death. I can pray for a brother who sinned the sin, but that sin has to be not unto death. It doesn't lead to eternal death. I can ask God, I can intercede for him in beseeching God's forgiveness. There is a sin unto death. Not concerning this do I say that he should make request. What John is saying is there are some people who are caught up in sin. They want forgiveness. We intercede. We pray in their behalf. But if they're going to continue in that sin, it's unto death. They're still going to suffer the consequences. If it is a sin not unto death, then not only do I have the privilege, but I have the obligation of praying for that brother. All right, what sins will God forgive then? Turn back to John chapter 1 and look, if you will, at verses 8 and following. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar. Every sin, He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Every sin that we confess with a penitent heart is a sin that can be forgiven. Now, this very theme, being on track, going in the right direction, getting off track, and then getting back, getting back on track again, implies these, these thoughts. It's possible for a child of God to sin so as to lose his soul, and it's possible to be forgiven, regardless of how serious that sin is. And I can't stress that enough. There's nothing that you can do, no sin in your life that cannot be forgiven. That's how powerful the blood of Jesus is. Now I want you to think about Peter for a moment. All of this is just some preliminary thoughts. That's why I keep looking at the clock and I'm thinking, I'm not going to get all this in tonight. <laughs> but we're going to do the best we can to make the really important points. I want you to think about Peter for a minute. Jesus said, 
I say unto thee that thou art Peter, rock, you're a rock, a little pebble. And even though it's a little pebble there and the foundation rock upon which, on which Jesus built the church is the foundational slab of Jesus being the Son of God, still it's interesting that Jesus chose this term rock to refer to Peter. <laughs> and he doesn't always live up to his expectations that Christ... I think Christ saw more in Peter than Peter saw in himself. I think he really did. He saw in Peter the capability of becoming a great leader. And perhaps that's why he selected Peter. But he wasn't as steady as that word might suggest. His road to maturity was a rocky road. But here's an interesting fact about Peter, and that is he's so much like us. Yeah, I've read an interesting uh, article on the internet some weeks back, and I wish I could have found that. I couldn't, but it was an article having to do with uh, out of all the 12 apostles, Paul being then the one that was sent to the Gentiles, which apostle do people most closely relate with? Who do you think it was? It's Peter. He's the most well-known. You ask somebody who were some of the apostles, they can remember Peter. They may not remember any of the others, but they can remember Peter. It's because Peter's so much like we are. He had his ups. He had his downs. He had those moments when there were silly outbursts of enthusiasm. I'll never deny you. I'll be with you till the death. If you're going to die, we're going to go with you to die. Outbursts of enthusiasm. I don't criticize Peter for that because I've done that sometimes and I said let's do let's go forward with this but I failed to follow through like I should and so he had the bursts of enthusiasm but three times denying the Lord or what the case we're going to study tonight about his apostasy at Antioch every one of those tells me something about Peter he was the most popular most popular apostle. And from his initial call when Jesus said, um, your name is now Peter, from that initial call until he writes that last epistle, and what a tender epistle that is, because it's filled with pathos and compassion. And it ends in verse 18, almost ending, where he says, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord. Brother Moser just did a class on 1 Peter. And you remember what the thrust of that class was? Peter was saying, you keep your joy even in the midst of persecution. Here was Peter who would deny his Lord and now later years in his life, he's saying to us, persecution is all around you, but you maintain your joy and your hope. James said the same thing in James chapter 1. Count it all joy when you fall into manifold trials and tribulations. How do I do that? You lack wisdom, James says, ask of God, who giveth to all liberally. He doesn't upbraid you. So we count it joy. And Peter's journey is really an incredible journey. And I can almost imagine the joy he must have felt when Jesus first called him to be a fisher of men, the downturn and despondency and discouragement he must have felt when he stumbled, and then encouragement when he rose again, and then discouragement. You see, up, up and down, up and down. But in all of Peter's life, it's, it's up, down a little bit, up higher, down a little, up higher. He's ever moving toward the cross. Look, Peter's life tells me it says to me, Tom Waycaster, you can make it to heaven. And all your frailties, you can still make it to heaven. Now, I'm going to give three points tonight, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, on track, full speed ahead. On track, full speed ahead. And then second of all, Peter derailed at Antioch. What a catastrophe. And then the third point is Peter back on track as he is restored and rehabilitated. Those are the three points we're going to look at. Let's talk about Cornelius, the case of Cornelius. And if you will, turn over to Acts chapter 10. And uh, this encounter with Cornelius, I think, is a milestone in Peter's life. 
And if I look at the history, the time frame in this, I get the impression that Peter has probably had a great ministry for about 10 years. Everything's moving up. He's on track, full speed ahead. And he's enjoying such tremendous blessings being a servant of God. He's able to preach to men in high places. He, he's there when Tabitha needs to be raised. I mean, uh, uh, Dorcas uh, needs to be raised from the dead. He's, uh, he's there by the man at the beautiful gate. Uh, can you imagine being able to do the things that Peter did and not experience the joy that he must have had? So here are some observations about Cornelius, and we're going to read the story of Cornelius in just a moment. But this sort of lays a background. Peter's had a successful 10 years of labor from Pentecost. Everything was going well. And now he's about to be introduced to one of the great challenges in his life. In fact, every one of the apostles had missed the point that the gospel was for the Gentiles. I don't know why God waited 10 years before he finally sent Peter to the household of Cornelius. I have no idea. Maybe the Gentiles weren't quite ready to receive it. I'll leave that up to God. But I knew, though, that it was a lapse of time. And so when I look at Cornelius and his, uh, the record that unfolds there, there's some great lessons in this. I want you to read with me, starting with verse 1, Acts chapter 10. And I'm, I'm going to read this and just make some observations along the way and maybe inject a couple of lessons as to why, why this case. Why was Peter sent to the household of Cornelius? Let's read a little bit. There was a certain man in, in uh, Caesarea, Cornelius by name, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man, one that feared God with all his house, who gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. You get the impression he was spiritually inclined? Yeah, he was. Um, he saw in a vision openly, as it were, about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming to him. And this angel says, Cornelius, and he tells him your prayers, last part of verse 4, and your alms are gone up for a memorial before God. And now you send men to Joppa. And there's a man there by the name of Simon, surnamed Peter, and he's lodging with one Simon a tanner. Pause there for just a minute. Uh, because Simon was a tanner, this, this man was a tanner, uh, he was in the taxidermy business, we might say, or scanning hides off of animals. He would have been constantly exposed to things that made him unclean, ceremonial by the law. And Peter's living with him. He's staying with him. Peter's already grasping the fact that the law is being taken away. Otherwise, that would have been horrible to associate with this man who was a tanner. And he lodged with a, one Simon a tanner whose house is by the seaside. When the angel that spake unto him was departed, he calls two of his household servants, and he dispatches them there with his, these servants to the house of Peter, sends him off down to the place where Peter is. Now on the morrow, verse 9, so they were departed the day before. They're on their way. It takes a full day to get to where Simon is. Simon, uh, as they were on their way, uh, Peter went up to the housetop to pray. Verse 9, about the sixth hour. He became hungry, desired to eat, and while he made ready, fell in a trance. And behold, the heaven opened, a certain vessel descending, as it were a great sheet, let down by four corners upon the earth. Wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts, and creeping things of the earth, birds of the heaven, Came a voice said, Peter, rise, kill, and eat. Well, Peter refuses to do that because it's unclean in ceremonial law, in the Mosaic law. And watch the inconsistency of Peter here. He doesn't have all of these facts right. This has not been revealed totally to the apostles yet. Peter would receive the vision, but Peter would be the one who would tell the other apostles what the truth was on this, as in chapter 11. So not all the apostles got the divine revelation. Peter got the revelation, and he then taught the other apostles. I find that curious. Let's see what happens now. Verse 17, Peter was much perplexed in himself with what the vision, what the vision which he had seen might mean. And about that time, here are the men that arrived with the, that were sent by Cornelius. 
And uh, they called and asked whether Simon, who was surnamed Peter, was lodging there. And Peter thought on the vision, verse 19, And the Spirit said to him, Three men are seeking you. Rise, get thee down, go with them. Look at this next phrase, nothing doubting. Peter, I don't want you to doubt. Just do what I'm asking you to do. And Peter went down to the men, I am he whom you seek. What's the cause whereof you are come? They said, Cornelius, a centurion, a righteous man, one that fears God, well reported of by all the nation of the Jews, was warned of God by a holy angel to send for thee into his house. And so he called them in and lodged them. And on the morrow, middle of verse 23, he arose and went forth with them, and certain of the brethren, I want you to look at this, certain of the brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Now what God had said to Peter, you go, don't doubt anything. But Peter is doubting how this is all going to turn out. So he takes men with him. Because he's going to the house of a Gentile. Well, you remember how the story unfolds. He gets to the household of Cornelius. And when you get down to verse 34, uh, let's read starting with verse 34. Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is acceptable to him. Peter was speaking by inspiration, and like all the prophets and inspired men, he may very well, in fact, I think I can say without fear of contradiction, he didn't know and understand fully what he was saying there. He didn't grasp the significance of it. That would come later. Now let's see what happens. Look at verse 44. While, he was yet, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Spirit fell on them that heard the word. Now from Luke's account in Acts 10, what you have is Peter proclaiming the message and then the Holy Spirit falls on Cornelius and he speaks in tongues. Do you see there in verse 46? But when I get over to chapter 11, look at verse 15. And this is Peter's account to the apostles. And here's what Peter tells them in verse 15. As I began to speak... The Holy Spirit fell on them even as on us at the beginning. I get the impression Peter is saying, I barely got the words out of my mouth. And Cornelius started speaking in tongues. He received something akin in Peter's mind, what we received all the way back there 10 years earlier on the day of Pentecost. Look folks, if the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a common thing today, why did Peter have to go back 10 years to find something to compare what, what had happened in Cornelius' house. It was, a unique, it was a unique situation. Now my question is, why did Cornelius speak in tongues? And I think when Peter grasped, on this, grasped all of this, I think he was at a spiritual high that maintained him as he traveled on through his Christian life. I want you to turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. You have to study 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 as a group. You have to. They're all dealing with the spiritual gifts. And when you get down to 1 Corinthians 14, and verse 20, Peter, uh, Paul's going to tell us something about the, the tongues, the gift of tongues. The Corinthians thought the gift of tongues was it. That's it. Boy, that's a sign of spirituality. But all the way through these chapters, Paul is rebuking the Corinthians because of their overemphasis on the tongues. Look at verse 21. In the law it is written, 1 Corinthians 14, 21. In the law it is written, By men of strange tongues and by the lips of strangers will I speak unto this people, and not even thus will they hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore tongues are for, don't miss this, brethren, tongues are for a sign not to them that believe, but to the unbelieving. Now I'm going to ask you a question. This is not original with me. I learned this years ago. On the day of Pentecost, who were the unbelievers? It were the, Gen it were the Jewish people that came to Pentecost. And they had to be taught the truth. And when Peter began speaking in tongues, that sign was a sign for those people who had come to Jerusalem that what Peter was saying was the truth. In the case of Cornelius... Cornelius speaking in tongues was a sign to Peter that Peter the gospel is for all men. 
And Peter's eyes were open. Peter was on track, full speed ahead. He's now preaching to the Jews and to the Gentiles, but we know that his commission was basically to the, uh, to the Jews and Paul to the Gentiles. But Peter's life is a rich life, and he's finding fulfillment of that life in Christ. Now, there are some things that come out of the case with Cornelius. I think here are some important lessons. Number one, it is possible to think we are on track when in fact we're not on track. Peter thought he was on track. And in some respects he was right on track. But when it came to preaching and teaching the Gentiles, he was off track. It's possible to think you're on track when you can be off track. Look at the denominational world today. How many of them think they're on track when in fact they're not? They're just not. I say that as kindly as I know how. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to examine those denominations and look at their doctrines and come to the understanding that they're in error. So it's possible to think you're on track when you're not on track. Here's another one. It's possible to be morally good and not be on track case Cornelius. And yet the general thinking of the world today is, you know, I'm a good old boy. I'm, I don't cheat anybody. I don't drink. I don't swear. I'm honest. I pay my taxes. I don't speed. And you're on track. Life is good. Income is good. You voted for the right person in office and you're proud that you put him there. And everything's just hunky-dory. But it's possible to think you're on track when in fact you're not on track. I learned that from Cornelius. Here's a third lesson from this case with Cornelius, and that is, it is a credit to Peter to see that he was willing to submit to the Lord's will when he was properly taught. How many people have ears, but they don't hear? And you can teach them the truth, and it's like it goes in one ear and right out the other. I had a man in Mount Pleasant, Texas. He was my financial advisor. Every time I went to see him, I'd talk to him about the Scriptures. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I was as blunt as I could be. And I'd say, I'd call his name and I'd say, you're just not going to go to heaven in a human man-made denomination of which you're a part. Well, that's great stuff. I'd, well, I believe that. But, but he's going in one ear and out the other. You have to give credit to Peter. This is where he's high. He's on track, full speed ahead. And he's confident in his salvation and willing to submit. And then last of all, you've got to admire the courage of Peter. What an amazing man that would go into the household of a Gentile and a Gentile who was a soldier at that. There's something intimidating about being in the presence of a soldier. My first trip into Soviet Union after they broke up was in a town called Omsk. And while I was there, I had the privilege of having two retired Soviet generals in my class. You talk about, I mean, they came in full uniform. I felt intimidated, but they were so kind. Peter had great courage. Now that's Peter on track, full speed ahead. That's my first point. <laughs> Let's look at a second point. Peter got derailed at Antioch, big time. Let's go, over to, let's go over to Galatians chapter 2. And when Paul writes this letter to the churches of Galatia, I wish I'd almost need to at least take a minute and say something about why was Galatians written. Churches throughout Galatia were being overrun with these Judaistic uh, uh, Judaizing teachers. You, you had to be circumcised in order to go to heaven. You see, what had happened was they opposed the gospel. When they found out they couldn't oppose the gospel, they tried to worm their way into the gospel and pervert the gospel. That's the way Satan works. He'll oppose you with persecution, and then if he sees he can't win through persecution, he's going to try to worm his way into the church and get a false doctrine in there. Paul in verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 said, Even if we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel, then that which we have preached, let him be what? Anathema. Let him be cut off. And so God is very serious about those who bring false doctrine in. 
When I look at the situation at the church at Galatia, I can see several sins that could lead, easily lead, to getting one off track. And these are just as relevant today as they were then. There's the sin of departing from God's Word, chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. That'll get you off track real quick, won't it? I wish I could say that every student that comes through MSOP stays faithful to the truth. They don't. I've only been here five years, and I can tell you they don't all stay faithful. And every preacher's training school is, every congregation is that way. False teaching draws people away. There's the sin of denying apostolic authority that's dealt with in chapter 1, verses, 6, verses 11 through 24. If you can get people to disregard apostolic authority, here's the apostle speaking to us right here. If you can get them to question this, you're going to derail them. You're going to get them off track. There's the sin of demanding where God does not demand. You have to be circumcised. That's what we call legalism, making laws that God did not make. By the way, legalism is not strict adherence to God's Word, brethren. Somebody says, well, you, you demand obedience in every respect. Absolutely I do. Not because I do, because the Bible demands it. Legalism is making laws that God didn't make. Liberalism is loosing where God didn't lose. You've got the sin of dissembling, and this is the sin that Peter got caught up in, and that simply means he played the part of a hypocrite. He withdrew and he plays the part of a hypocrite. Now this is where the contrast comes in that we're dealing with in this lesson. I saw Peter at his greatest, at his height, when he opened the doors to the Gentiles. And now I'm going to see him at his lowest. Let's start reading in Galatians chapter 2, starting with verse 11. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I'd like to know more about that journey that Peter made to Antioch. I don't have any information on it. I resisted him to the face because he stood condemned. For before that, certain came from James... He ate with the Gentiles, but when they came, he drew back and separated himself. Let me paint you a portrait here of what's taking place. Peter comes to Antioch, and he's preaching this new doctrine that God gave to him. Gospel is for the Gentiles, full fellowship. Not partial fellowship, not second-class citizens. Full fellowship with the Gentiles, even the uncircumcised. And here come some Jews, and they get Peter off in a corner, or maybe publicly say something, and Peter gets afraid. And what does he do? He, withdraw, he, he, he backtracks on what he had taught in the city where Cornelius was at, in Caesarea. Fear will cause a person to backtrack even when he's got the truth. And so he dissembled. That means he plays the part of a hypocrite. Now let's continue to read and see what happens. For that before that certain came from James, he ate with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back, separated himself, fearing them that were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews dissembled likewise, the rest of the Jews, with him. Some who were fellowshipping Gentiles. Peter was so powerful in what he did and his influence that when Peter withdrew, they followed Peter, maybe because he was an apostle. Maybe they thought he was infallible. Mark this down. The apostles were inspired, but they were not infallible men. They still had the sins that they committed. And the rest of the Jews dissembled, even Barnabas. Can you imagine Barnabas? Even Barnabas was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, watch this, before them all. Here's a child that's called up to the blackboard in school. He's given a mathematical question. The teacher says, Johnny, put this formula down there. He puts it down there and he comes up with the wrong answer. What does the teacher do? No, that's not correct. And she corrects in the presence of all. At least they used to. I don't know if they do that in school anymore or not. <laughs> I think maybe anymore. If nobody's wrong, everybody's right. Now, that's crazy. That's just the best word I got for it. But when a sin is public, you have to deal with it publicly. If sin is private, go to the person privately. But when it's public, deal with it publicly. Paul said, I, I, before every one of them, I told Cephas where his error was. Look at verse 15. We being Jews by nature, 
and not sinners of the Gentiles, yet knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law through faith in Je but through faith in Jesus Christ, even we believe in Christ Jesus that we might be manifest by faith. Now, so the, the point being is that Paul withstood Peter. This was his low point when he played the part of a hypocrite and another apostle had to rebuke him. When I look at Peter's sin, I see some specifics in what he did. And this plays out in, in, in modern day. You don't have to be an apostle or, or even in the age of the miraculous. But look at this. Peter bowed to the pressure from those who were in error. He feared them. He bowed to the pressure. When you stand for the truth, you're going to be pressured at work, sometimes at home, sometimes at school. You're going to be pressured. Second of all, he feared those that were of the circumcision. He had a literal fear for what reason, I don't know. He disregarded, number three, what he had learned earlier. You put the Word of God out of your mind, you're going to do things you, didn't, you wouldn't believe you, imaginable. You, you're going to engage in things that will discourage you and cause you to fall. Number four, he influenced others to do as he had done. The danger of of a bad influence comes in here. The 73rd Psalm is a psalm written by Asaph. And Asaph had essentially looked at the wealthy all around him. And he said, uh, when I saw all their prosperity, everything seemed to go good for them. I almost slipped. And then he, Asaph makes this observation. He said, I decided I wouldn't say anything to anybody else lest I cause them to fall away. I've got to give Asaph credit for that. Here's my point. You are influencing people every day of your life for either good or bad. And sometimes you don't even know the influence you're having upon them. People are watching us. And so Peter influenced others for the bad. And then last of all, he didn't practice what he preached. How many times have you heard people say, well, uh, church is just full of hypocrites. What are they saying? You're not practicing what you preach. Now that's a feeble excuse and I don't have time to chase that rabbit but you see the danger of, of Peter's mistake here of his sin? He was influencing others to violate the very will of God. So Peter was on track full speed ahead. Everything going great. He was privileged to open the door for the Jews in Acts 2 and he's privileged to open the door for the Gentiles in Acts chapters 10 and 11. Everything's great until he got derailed at Antioch, and now he's off track, and Paul had to correct him. Now my third point tonight, very quickly. I want to think about the words restored and rehabilitated, and I want to use an example of an athlete here. When an athlete, let's say he tears a tendon or he breaks a bone or whatever, and we treat him medically to get him back on his feet, the bone can heal, the, um, the muscles can heal, the tissue can heal, and he may be restored to physical health, but until he can go back to doing what he did before, he's not rehabilitated. Now, let's take that and apply it in a spiritual way. Spiritual rehabilitation suggests several things. Number one, it suggests forgiveness. And then it suggests taking that individual who's broken and restoring him to a point of useful service in God's kingdom. Now, since Peter was a leader, I'm going to focus on how, what principles can we learn with regard to rehabilitating leaders. Uh, I don't know about you, I've read a number of books on fallen leaders in the Lord's church. I've known a lot of leaders in the church who have fallen away. I've known preachers who have been drawn into sin. I've known preachers' wives who have been drawn into sin. I've known elders who have been shamed by some sin, deacons who maybe were caught in dishonesty. And immediately, of course, they resign their position, as they should, and we go about then trying to restore them. But so often we stop at the being restored, asking for forgiveness, making confession, and restored to fellowship. But we, for some reason, we don't carry them back to the point where they're 
talents are being used as they were before. I know there are consequences to sin, and some consequences will be there for a lifetime. Preacher may never preach again, but he can find usefulness in the Lord's church in some other capacity. So we seek to rehabilitate. I want you to turn over to John chapter 20. Uh, John chapter 21. Uh, and this is an amazing chapter for this reason. I think this is the Lord's attempt to rehabilitate Peter at this point. To rehabilitate him. You're familiar with how this unfolds. Start with verse 15. So when they had broken their fast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, lovest thou me more than these? And he said, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. That's Jesus said, Do you love me, agape? Peter responds, I love you, phileo. Agape is the greatest degree of love. Phileo is a, a kind companionship and an attempt to have this warmth of friendship that's there. And so he said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said, You know I love you. Same words are used. Agape by Christ, phileo by Peter. And then he said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, lovest thou me? And Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? But Jesus used phileo. Now, there's a lot of explanations on that. And I'm, I wish I had the time just to look at the possibilities. But there's one point that I want to emphasize. And I came across this a number of years ago. This is an article by Stan Mitchell in the Gospel Advocate of January 2019. And when he looks at this example right here, he focuses on this aspect of restoring, rehabilitating a fallen leader. Peter was on track. He got derailed at Antioch. And then he was not only restored, he was rehabilitated. And look what he became after that and wrote those two wonderful epistles in the closing years of his life. Here's some points that Brother Stan Mitchell makes, and we'll close with these. I'm going to just read a few of his comments. It's too obvious to point out that one reinstates only fault. It's too obvious to point out that one reinstates only fault in leaders. Can we possibly assume Peter was under a cloud following his performance at the trial of Jesus? How do you think Peter felt? When he denied Jesus, depression? Yeah. He was down, wasn't he? He wept bitterly. People are funny, Brother Mitchell writes. If Peter's colleagues felt he had let the Lord down, they seemed to have conveniently forgotten that their own less than stellar performances on the part of the other apostles. Rebuilding those who have fallen is a vital part of developing leaders. If we do not choose leaders from the ranks of the flawed and the imperfect, who else is left? And if one wishes to lead who feels he is flawless and perfect, do we really want him as a leader? That's a good point. Now here's the points that Brother uh, Mitchell makes that I want to share with you. Notice some things about Jesus' reinstatement of his fishermen slash apostle. First, he reinstated only the ones who had wept bitterly. David wept when he sinned. You have to go through weeping to be reinstated and to be rehabilitated. Second, he did so by demanding three times that Peter confess his loyalty to God. Why three times? I like to think that Jesus was saying, for every time you denied me, I want a reinstatement of your commitment and dedication. Three denials, three confessions here. And third of all, he did so by immediately charging him with responsibility. Brethren, if we have leaders that fall away, they get derailed, and you want to get them back on track and rehabilitate them, don't stick them off in a corner and forget about them. They've got abilities. And just as Peter was reinstated and rehabilitated to be a great service for God, even fallen leaders can be restored. So I've seen Peter on track, full speed ahead. And your life may be such that everything's full speed ahead right now. Watch out because the derailment may just be around the corner.
But if the derailment comes, always remember this. There is the possibility of being reinstated. And by the grace of God, you can still be a great servant for Christ. I think I'm supposed to quit at five after. I got three minutes. I'd ask you any questions, but I probably wouldn't be able to hear anyway. So let's, <laughs> let's go ahead and be dismissed. And uh, Do we make our way over there now? You know what? If we went now, we'd beat the kids, wouldn't we? <laughs> okay, you're dismissed. They didn't let us in last night.